Good afternoon. So glad you could all make it out today. So I'm here to talk about my book, Conversations with Atiyah. Uh, I was fortunate enough over the course of the last year to do some of the last recorded interviews with Vic Atiyah prior to his passing in July. And kind of the main themes of the book that I wanted to get across, I didn't want it to be a typical biography. I wanted it to be more about the way that wisdom is passed down from one generation to the next. And I think the front cover kind of exemplifies that. And I wanted to try to find ways to tie together the past, the present, and the future as well. And what started it and inspired it was I've been reading a lot about Oregon history the last couple of years. Uh, we live in Wilsonville, short, you know, within walking distance of the library, and I have a young son, and he loves to go to the library, so we go down there quite frequently. And I got to read about people like Tom McCall, uh, Charles Sprague, Mark Hatfield, Charles Henry Martin, Charles McNary. And so here's a picture of the slideshow. This is the governor's ceremonial office. And so right near, next to me, a lot of the folks I just mentioned, Hatfield, McCall, uh, Straub, Atia, and John Kitzhaber. And oddly enough, John Kitzhaber's literally above himself there. So you have the Kitzhaber from the 90s, and then Kulangoski over to the side, and then there's Kitzhaber again. And so um, I had to make the connection, though. I became fascinated. You look, hear about figures like Vic Atiyah, and they're, they're, you know that they're your current and future historical figures. And it turns out that I knew people that knew them. And so there's former state rep Patrick Sheehan. I got to know him a few years back when I was reporting at the Estacada News. And so uh, he was able to put us in touch with each other. He said, well, before you do interviews with him, though, uh, there's his exhibits are on this display over there at Pacific University in Forest Grove. So you might want to take a field trip. So I did that uh, November of 2013. So I brought my little boy with me, and there he is. And after a while, uh, we realized that we'd have to take a second field trip. And we decided to visit some of the sites that were significant to Governor Atiyah's life. So we went to the current Atiyah Brothers location, uh, and then we went to one of its original locations. So this is Southwest 10th and Washington over there in Portland. And what's interesting is that at this intersection there, this location, 100 years later, is out of all things on Earth, a rug store just like it was 100 years ago. So we thought that was interesting. One of the other sites we visited, this is Washington High School in Portland, where a young Vicatia was involved in student government after his fellow students had nominated him. And we got there just in time. It was an active construction site undergoing a remodel. So that, that's what was going on there when we stopped by. So we had our first discussion, and it was just about a year ago, and that is a title, a chapter in the book entitled History and Heritage. So, as you know, his family had immigrated over from the Middle East from what is now Syria, except back then, in the early 1900s, it was all the Ottoman Empire still. And so we talked about that for a while, and it, it was interesting to me to hear what the American dream meant to somebody like Vic Atiyah. So here's somebody who was a first-generation American who went on to be governor. That's incredible. Uh, so I got his perspective on that, as well as kind of the short-term and long-term of what's been going on in the Middle East. A lot of folks hear about Syria, and you think about the civil war that's been going on the last couple of years. But what was it like for him as somebody who had history and heritage from that area? So that was a lot of what we talked about. And plus, just overall foreign policy. What is the U.S. doing in the Middle East? He seemed to think that no good could come of it. Uh, we also talked about him growing up, what it was like during the Great Depression as a kid. And uh, World War II shaped his generation and definitely affected his life as well. Um, both of his brothers, his twin brothers, ended up serving there and were prisoners of war. They'd fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, I asked him about his fondest memories growing up. And he said that part of it was that he grew up in an ethnically diverse neighborhood over there in Solomon's Gulch um, by Portland over by where the Lloyd Center is now. 
And that ended up being a really big part of his later on, of his life, that perspective that he got growing up in an ethnically diverse neighborhood because he didn't think of people as belonging to this race or that race. To him, they were all just people. They were just his buddies growing up. Um, so that was our first talk. A about a year ago, he gave a speech at this event put on by the North Clackamas Chamber of Commerce over at Happy Valley City Hall. And his theme, the theme of his speech was how to use statesmanship and compromise. And part of the speech wasn't how to operate a mouse with PowerPoint. Because <laughs> I may, may or may not have gotten that. There we go. So I took some pictures. So here he is chatting with Vern Duncan. Now, Vern Duncan, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the name, he was Secretary of Education in the Atiyah administration. He's also a former state legislator. He holds the unique distinction of having served in the legislature in Oregon and Idaho. And uh, to his right there is Representative Julie Parrish, and in the background, State Senator Chuck Thompson. And here he is with Patrick Sheehan. Great picture there. Absolutely love that. And there's... Governor Atiyah telling us how to use statesmanship and compromise. And in that speech, he gave a lot of really great advice for all the people in the room. One of them that I thought was interesting was, he said, once you're elected and you're serving in office, approach every decision like you never plan to run again. And there's a lot of people who get into office and they base every single decision on, well, how is this going to affect my reelection? What are people going to think of it? He never approached it that way. He said his cabinet, once he got to be governor, his top administrative officials, it took them a while to realize that he was taking that approach, not thinking about re-election here, and that it actually helps make those decisions a lot easier when you do that, because then you do it based on the merits of, is this good for the people of the state, rather than using you know, political calculations for everything. Our next talk took place uh, at spring break, so this was late March. And we did most of our interviews at a coffee shop inside of Fred Meyer, right over by his house. That way, we could talk for an hour and he could go do his grocery shopping. It was just convenient for everybody. And really, really enjoyed this talk. Um, and it comprises a chapter entitled Boy Scouts Football and the Legislature. So that's most of what we talked about there. And my favorite part of the talk about Boy Scouts um, he said he never made Eagle Scouts, but his son Tom did. And when he talked about that, he just beamed with pride. I mean, you could just see him glowing when he mentioned that. We talked about his stint in student government at Washington High School. He never sought it out. Other students nominated him. And the same thing happened many years later when he ran for the legislature. Now, since uh, the Super Bowl's a couple of weeks away, this is timely, we talked about football. Uh, Governor Atia was an offensive lineman, which I thought was hilarious because even at, his, at the prime, I'm thinking, okay, 160, 180 maybe, and I'm being generous, was not that big of a man. And you see the kind of guys that are playing offensive line these days, right? Just huge hulking men. <laughs> so, so there was that image there. And I loved his stories. He talked about at Washington High School how one of the teams he was on, they had a phenomenal defense, fewest points scored on them out of any team in the league. Ended up at the very bottom though, no offense whatsoever. <laughs> we had a whale of a defense, but no offense, he said. By the time we got to the University of Oregon to play for the Ducks, he said their freshman team was really good. And he shared with me a couple of Civil War stories. You know, every year that's such a big deal here in Oregon where you have the Ducks and the Beavers going at it. That was the case even back then too. Uh, what I thought was funny was he said his parents didn't even want him to play football. He'd broken his arm when he was a kid riding his bike, he'd broken his leg playing baseball, and he said, I very calmly told them, no, I'm playing football. And that was the end of that. <laughs> so he did get uh, an offer from the Green Bay Packers, who uh, my Seahawks somehow beat yesterday <laughs> in an incredible game. But what happened at the time was that his brothers had already gone off to war, his father had passed away, and it wouldn't have been right. And the thought never occurred to him to do anything other than the right thing in that case. He had to do right by his family, and he had to run the family business. So there was no way I could justify just giving all that up to go play football. 
And if he, he said that if he had done the wrong thing, it would have haunted him for the whole rest of his life. I absolutely believe him that. Another great story that to come out of that was that when his brothers got back from the war, they went back and finished school. And so his wife, Dolores, would constantly ask him, you should go back to school, you should go back to school. And finally he said, "Hun, the only reason I would go back to school would be to play football. And I think that's a bad reason to go back to school. So we also talked about his 20 year stint in the legislature. It's a lot of ground to cover. And I asked him, well, what was your favorite memory? Your 20 years serving in the legislature. He actually said that it was the days of the phone booth caucus. So this was after the 1976 elections, after Watergate, where Republicans just got destroyed across the board. There were so few Republicans in the Oregon Senate, where I now work, that they could literally physically fit into a phone booth. And yet, these were his fondest memories. He says, well, really, why would that be? Oh, I've served in the legislature and worked there as a member of the majority party, been in there in the minority. Here he was in the super duper minority. And it's his fondest experience. Well, he said that for one, the photo op was funny. So I can look back at that picture, it makes me smile, it makes me laugh. But he said it was the camaraderie between him and his fellow caucus members, that they were actually able through the process, through committee, to make bad bills better, right? They still made their mark on the session. They didn't pick fights that they couldn't win, because when you're, there's only seven of you, then there's only so much you can do, right? But all the members of that caucus went on to do great things. He went on to be governor. Uh, you had Wally Carson, who went on to be a Supreme Court judge. You had Tony Meeker, you know, state treasurer. Um, so another guy went on to Congress. So they were able to do great things long term. And this is one of the quotes that he left me with. And I'll just repeat it word for word here. This is what ends that particular chapter. He says, I look back on my career, not only about Vicatia, but people that worked with me and how proud and pleased they were. They felt good about it. You can't beat that. So I think that really shows you where he was at in life. And that was my single biggest takeaway from talking to him, that he'd had time to reflect. He felt good about his life and the decisions that he'd made. And he should be. Our final talk, and in between, there was a campaign kickoff event for Representative Parrish at a supporter's home over there in West Lynn. So there's them. And then here's me and... Uh, my friend, Representative Richardson, stepdaughter Madeline, and then there's me and Representative Richardson and Vic. Our last talk took place on Memorial Day, and this theme was the art of campaigning. Here's some of his old campaign literature there. So the primary election had just happened, so it was kind of fresh on my mind. Wanted to see what he had to say about campaigning, and his first lost first, last, and only loss took place in the 1974 election, where it was him and Robert Straub, and Straub beat him that first time. And then they, he ran again four years later. So I said, what was the most important thing you learned from that loss? He said, well, I learned that you have to have a driver. Now, I've been a handler, you know, I've done a few campaigns, and anymore, that's just second nature. If you're the candidate, you don't drive. You're making phone calls, you're going over your notes, your, your speech, you're doing literally anything else. So we thought that was hilarious. He'd insisted on driving himself everywhere in that first campaign. We also talked a little bit about speech writing, um, and I've done some speech writing, and, and so we had a really good anecdote about that, where he'd always relied, like I am right now, on kind of handwritten notes, index cards, and his, after the primary election, his team said, okay, well, you need to write a speech. He said, well, I, I can't write a speech, and I can't deliver a written speech. He said, no, 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 we need to see a speech. You must write a speech. So he said, here he is after the primary on this bright, beautiful, sunny day, just struggling and sweating through writing this speech. And finally, the day comes where he has to deliver it, and he does, and his staff comes over and says, well, you were right, Vic. You can't write a written speech, and you can't deliver a written speech. So I thought that was a really, really funny anecdote. We also talked about canvassing. Oh, one of the incredible, the important aspects of doing a campaign is actually getting out and hitting doors. And he told me the story about when he went to do that in Albany once, where he shows up and he's talking to one of the neighbors and the guy says, well, don't talk to the guy next door, he's a drunk, right? So he shows up right in the middle of this fight between neighbors and handled it as, as Vicatia could, you know, with the utmost of professionalism and sincerity. 
So I thought that was really funny. We also, in that talk, um, discussed a lot of the former U.S. presidents that he got to know. And this was really fascinating for me. I mean, I was born in 1980, so when you talk about somebody like Ronald Reagan, I mean, to me, that was just the guy I saw on TV being president when I was a kid, right? But he was really fond of Gerald Ford. Really, really just adored Gerald Ford. They had the Boy Scout connection, and that was huge for them. But he also talked about how this is right around the time of the pardoning of Richard Nixon. He was invited to go to the White House for a briefing. And so he starts off his morning in Portland, gets on a plane, flies all the way out to D.C., you know, he's in the Oval Office doing that, flies all the way back, and somehow that night ended up at an event in eastern Oregon. Right? So he says, wow, you think about all the things you could do in the space of a day. So I thought that was great. Um, and he also talked about how after Ford was done being president, they had some mutual friends, so he'd frequently go down and play golf with him down in Palm Springs. He said he had a picture, and it was one of his favorites, and it's, he's putting, and Gerald Ford's holding the flag. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. One of the most, my favorite part of that talk was, uh, he talks about his re-election bid in 1982. To put it into perspective, that was the last time a Republican in Oregon won a governor's race. I was two, <laughs> two years old after the time. And you know, as it is, he, he defeated Ted Kulingoski, who then went on to be a two-term governor. The circumstances in 1982 were less than ideal. I know those of you that were around back then can remember that the national economy was just absolutely terrible. You had double-digit interest rates, which it was terrible for the housing market, which in turn was really bad for Oregon's timber-based economy. The budget was in free fall. They were having to make cuts. They were having to do special sessions. They had to raise revenues. And yet he still somehow won in a landslide? I mean, people have been thrown out of office under much better circumstances than that. So I asked him, how did you pull that off? He said, well, it was simple. I was just honest with the people. I told the public what was happening and why it was happening and said, look, we're trying our best and we will get through this. And they believed him. So I think there was a lot, lot that I could take away from that. And I wanted to do one last interview with him. I was shooting for the 4th of July because it was a three-day weekend. Well, it turned out that his 70th wedding anniversary was the day before, so it wasn't going to work out. And then one of his nephews had been in a crash. So we said, okay, we'll, we'll wait a couple of weeks and then we'll reconnect. But in the meantime, he had had a fall, and his wife had had a fall, and uh, he was hospitalized, and before we knew it, we had lost him. And I wanted to do just that one last interview with him, um, but it just wasn't meant to be. And I realized pretty quickly that, wow, I've, I've got a treasure here. So this is him in his own words, talking about his life and times. And I tell you, this whole project was very nearly lost. Because it was right around then, sometime in June, that my laptop had crashed. <laughs> right? But right before it crashed, I sent what I'd had so far to Representative Julie Parrish so she could write the foreword for the book. And so it was salvaged solely because of that. Uh, so it was very, very lucky. And then I also wanted to talk about the front cover photo here. So that's Governor Atiyah with my son. And this exemplified what I wanted to get across for the contents of the book. Here's me passing my wisdom on down to you. Um, what's actually happening here is they're playing a hand slapping game. <laughs> and I just happened to catch it at this perfect moment in time. And I knew as soon as I took it, I said, that's it right there. That's the front cover shot. That's exactly what I'm going for. So you saw the original picture earlier with a bunch of tables and chairs and things in the background. So I sent that to a friend of mine to do the photo editing for it. And she sent it back to me on July 20th. I was out of town, I didn't get back until that night. And that was when he'd passed away and we found out. So I went and checked my inbox the next morning and, and here it is, this image. And if you look closely, it almost looks like he's glowing. And that, to me, my jaw just dropped as soon as I saw it. I said, wow, this is incredible. This is almost like Angel Vic, you know, Vic in angel form, passing his wisdom on down to you. So that, it was an honor to get to know him. I wish I would have been able to talk with him more. 
but I enjoyed every moment of it, and I'm just glad that I can pass it on now. And it's available on Amazon. It's in the Wilsonville Library, which is just an honor. And uh, it should be by now in every branch of the, Grants, of the Josephine County Library System down in my hometown of Grants Pass. Uh, Conversations with Atia is the name. So um, really glad to be able to come here and share this with you guys. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Scott. Folks, now it's time for questions, and please, as a reminder, only forum members get to ask questions. The microphone is over here. For those of you that are experienced at asking questions, the microphone used to be over there, but it's now over here. <laughs> so please don't go to the wrong side of the room. And Scott will entertain a few questions for a few minutes before our second presentation. And folks, just before we turn it over for questions, just a reminder, the folks here at the Peppermill Restaurant serve us gracefully, and we are grateful for how well they manage to serve us without disrupting speakers. Let's not forget to leave a substantial tip for those folks that work so hard for us. And as people are lining up for questions, I believe we have one now. Sir, go ahead. Scott, thanks for being here. Uh, great presentation, really informative. I'm wondering if you can tell me if you've got uh, another project or two lined up. Uh, you know, this isn't your first book. Could you tell me first what other books uh, you've written and second, what you might have in the future for us? Sure. So the first book that I wrote uh, came out in 2013 and it's called Transition. And it's almost like the, re the Great Recession Diaries. And it was inspired by watching everybody I know go through prolonged periods of unemployment and then going through it myself. But against that backdrop, I kept seeing all these people my age and younger getting elected to office. And it happened, 2010 election was the first time we saw it. And there was some more of it this last election. Uh, for example, in Washington State, this 24-year-old was elected to the legislature. West Virginia, an 18-year-old. Um, and we now have from New York, the member, the youngest member of Congress ever elected. And so there's this whole younger generation and a peaceful transition of power going on right now. And it's only just beginning. So that's the first book. In terms of next projects, I have a set of campaign diaries. And the first half is from this ill-fated congressional race I did in 2004. The second half of it is from this successful statewide ballot measure I worked on in 2012. And it's actually quite delightful. I mean, it's, I would dare say that it's better than either of these other books. I have to clear it through some folks first, though. Not that I have to, but I probably should. And when I do, I mean, I'm hoping to get it out next year, because obviously it's a presidential election year, and I'd want to get it out before the New Hampshire primaries and, and all that. So I, I would watch out for that. And then, you know, I also keep track of kind of the day-to-day -day experience of working at the Capitol and what that's like. A while back, I read a book by former state treasurer, longtime legislator Howard Belton called Under 11 Governors. And it was kind of his capital memoirs and it took a really great approach to it. So it, in the event that I ever think that there's demand for such a thing, uh, I could probably release that too. But you know, reputationally and professionally, I don't want to be known as a kiss and tell and I never will. Uh, because that's not the approach that I would take anyway. It would be more just anecdotes and kind of what it looks like day to day as opposed to trying to make anybody look bad, though Lord knows I definitely could if I wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Scott. My name is Phil Nelson, and I'm a retired lawyer from Grants Pass. I was oh, practicing down there when you were born. And uh, Debs Potts was a, a friend and a client, and uh, he was very proud of his being appointed to the chairmanship of the Lottery Commission. And of course, Debs was a Democrat, and uh, Vic was a Republican. And then I worked later with uh, Vic on getting a funding together to do a, a bronze uh, uh, bust of Debs, which is in the Josephine County Courthouse. Maybe you've seen it. But in any event, did Vic, I thought, was very, very good Governor T on nonpartisanship. And I wonder if you might dwell a little bit on his nonpartisanship as kind of a message to us about what we could maybe be doing more of today. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. And yes, I would walk by that bust of Debs Potts every day because I covered county government literally day in and day out for four years there. And you know, the third bridge in Grants Pass is also named after him. 
and I drove over that bridge you know, multiple times a day. So I have a lot of respect for Deb's Potts and everything that he did. In fact, uh, when I first started working in the Senate, and they've got pictures of all the senators on the wall, and I'd always go and check that out. And they have a room there named after Deb's Potts that I think the Secretary of the Senate, Lori Brocker, if I, that's her office. And so a lot of respect there. The thing about Governor Atia was that the whole time he was serving in the Oregon House, he was in the minority. The Democrats ran that chamber. And by the time the Republicans uh, took control of the House, he was no longer a member of that body. He was over in the Senate where, once again, he was a member of the minority. And so when it comes to legislation, when you're actually in the building making laws, that kind of bipartisanship is critical. And I think he set a very good example for that. And the whole time he was governor, the Democrats were in charge of the legislature. So I think that's a really important lesson to learn coming into this next session where I'm in the Senate, where we're in the mi super minority. And the House is a single vote away from Republicans being in the super minority. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, there's a lot of very, very liberal Democrats in the legislature who I have a lot of respect for because they represent their constituency. And those are the people that sent them there and the values that they have and that they wanted to see reflected in the people represented. It, and I respect these folks because they're honest about where they come from and you can disagree with them at the end of the day, but Vic was very good about that. You're not disagreeing with the person, you're disagreeing about the policy. And even then, you know, a lot of us legislative geeks that have been around the process a lot, the hard work is done in committee. And you can take a bill that starts off as absolutely atrocious, and you make some amendments here and there to reflect the concerns of some stakeholders and other people, and before you know it, you've taken, and it's a completely different piece of legislation. And with legislation, it's much easier in the process to kill a bill than it is to pass one. And that's worth mentioning, because by the time it does get signed into law, you've had it looked at by literally every member of that body in some form or another. And so that kind of bipartisanship and compromise is critical. And I'd like to see more of it. And uh, there is decorum in the legislature. And a lot of the floor fights are scripted ahead of time because they don't let it get beyond a certain point. And I think everyone that's there has enough respect for the institutions themselves to keep it that way. And, and I'm really happy about that. Yeah, so I have a real quick question, if I can just, I think, to get a simple answer. Um, thank you, Scott, for coming and sharing uh, your version of writing this wonderful book. Well, a number of years ago, Vic uh, Tia was a guest here at the forum, and, and he gave a wonderful presentation. Um, first of all, are you preparing your son to be a future governor? Um, no, no, I'm just kind of curious about that. But more importantly, uh, where can we go to get your book? Is this available on the internet? Or uh, how do you go about it? And who's your publisher? What's sure. Publisher. <laughs> so I'll take those in order. My son at this point, when he grows up, wants to be a wrestler or a football player. Uh, his mother has objections to both of these things, uh, much less so with the football player. <laughs> You know, if he plays for the Seahawks, that's fine. If he wants to play for the Packers or someone else, then you know, I still have to root for them. Uh, but yes, the book is available on Amazon.com. It's also, and I'm really proud of this, it's at the Capitol gift shop. So the same state capitol where I work day in and day out. There's copies of my book, and it's actually, it keeps selling out over there. I mean, we've literally had a really hard time keeping copies in stock and available. And uh, like I mentioned, it's at the Wilsonville Library as well. And my publisher, it's uh, this company based in Carleton just outside of Yamhill called Rydenbaugh Press. And they deal mostly with history and politics in the Pacific Northwest. So that's their whole niche. And I was able to do my first book through them and, and this book as well. And it's been a, a beneficial working relationship. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jorgensen, thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we can now come to the second part of our program today. And with us, we have Lori Stewart, the Vice Chair of the Washington County Council on Human Rights. We could have had her on another day, but this is Martin Luther King Day, and we're really, really pleased to be able to have the council share with us what they have been doing and a wonderful project that they're undertaking right now. Ms. Stewart, please.
There's stuff here. Sorry. Let me get let me get myself all adjusted. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here, um, especially on an occasion that is important to us in the human rights um, world. Um, and let me see if I can work this properly. Okay. Um, I am the vice chair of the Human Rights Council, but I have to make a confession. Um, when I was first asked to join the Human Rights Council by Emily Georges Gottfried, who was one of the founding members, um, I said yes because it was Emily who asked me. I don't know if any of you knew Emily Georges Gottfried, but fabulous human being and basically didn't do anything that wasn't good and didn't ask other people to do anything that wasn't good. So I just blindly trusted that, yes, this is a good thing and yes, I will do this because she asked me. But I didn't exactly know what it meant to talk about human rights in the context of Washington County. And this is embarrassing because I have a career that has been based in all kinds of things, social justice, human rights. Um, I've worked in public health campaigns in the third world and I've worked in, uh, you know, for crime victims and with prosecution teams and with law enforcement and with um, currently with the state uh, of Oregon with the Department of Human Services. Um, so, you know, this is my world. So I should know what human rights are. I didn't really. Um, and I found out I wasn't the only one. All of the other pe members of my council, we were also just sort of like, you know, this is Washington County. This is nice, peaceful, wonderful Washington County, one of the nicest places to live in the world. Um, and we actually had some discussions, and I just dropped this and I have to pick it up. We had some discussions that were literally kind of like a, so what does human rights mean to you? I'm embarrassed about this because it turned out I learned a few weeks later that, no, there's a very, very specific meaning to what human rights are and what human rights violations are that I was relatively ignorant of despite the fact that I worked in that field. And I was not the only one, and that's, that's my, my one defense is that I was not alone in that. Um, the, oh, I, okay, human rights are derived from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and so it has a very, very specific meaning. The Universal um, Declaration of Human Rights was passed on the heels of World War II, um, and it was uh, an effort that was led primarily by Eleanor Roosevelt. It was United Nations agreed. It was the first time that there had been international agreement on a definition of what basic human rights should look like. And it, was, it came out of the horrors of World War II. Um, and that was actually kind of alluded to in one of the, the um, whereas clauses in the preamble. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. And that was very much the mood of the original passage of, of the UDHR. Um, it's become the most translated document in the world. Uh, it's now hit the 370 languages mark. And it has, um, the 30 articles in that have inspired and guided laws, um, the creation of laws around the world, other human rights work around the world, and it has achieved the unique status of being considered customary international law. So it's kind of a big deal, and it has inspired a whole bunch of good work, um, and it has 30 very specific articles, which we don't need to cover in detail, they're instantly recognizable to a lot of Americans because the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Bill of Rights, and the U.S. legal tradition and civil rights tradition was one of the main inspirations for the development of the UDHR. And so some of the things are clearly recognizable. Instead of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's life, liberty, and security of person. Um, and, uh, but it includes a bunch of the other things that are recognizable to us, free speech, freedom of religion, um, the right to a fair trial, uh, the right to due process, pretty basic stuff that we, we kind of take for granted in this country, but was radical and new to much of the world, and maybe still is. Um, so those are the first 15, and again, I, I won't go over them all, but here's the second 15. Um, Let me catch myself up here so that I can get to the right page myself. Okay, so, so those are the different articles. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Still, again, in the context of Washington County, nice, peaceful Washington County. 
So do we say, oh, well, there's no geno genocide happening here, so all is well. Um, and that's the thing, is I think to a lot of people, when you think of human rights, you think of atrocities, you think of the really nasty stuff. Um, and it was inspired by that. You know, the Nazis in, in, in Germany were um, a major inspiration to the development of what these ought to look like. But the absence of visible atrocities doesn't mean that human rights abuses aren't happening because there are levels of abuses. Now, within those levels, ooh, it's not working now. My mouse is dead. Oh, yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> Five basic levels of abuses. At the most serious level, you have abuses that are dri openly driven by the state and they use all of the resources of the state in order to pursue these abuses of human rights. Um, and so it's, when it's official policy and law, that's where you get the highest body counts and the most severe kinds of abuses. The example of that would be Nazi Germany or more currently ISIS in Syria and, and uh, Iraq currently. Um, next level down is a little bit less severe. Um, the state denies abuses, but still drives them. So it's just in secret. It's a, often a very well-known secret. Examples of that is Pinochet's Chile, um, the KGB, the SAVAK, uh, are kind of classic examples of that, that level. The scale is smaller, though, because they have to hide it, and, or they're sort, sort of trying to hide it. It's not quite at the same level as the open one, where you can actually get in trouble for not doing these things. Third level, the state tolerates, but it doesn't drive abuse. It just turns a blind eye. Now, this is particularly relevant to us on Martin Luther King Day because that was what was happening in southern states when, during the civil rights movement. In fact, even his death. Um, you know, it wasn't that hard to figure out who the killers were, but getting them prosecuted, getting them successfully prosecuted was very difficult because the state was pretty practiced in, or the southern states were pretty practiced in turning a blind eye to those kinds of abuses. Birmingham church bombing was another example of that. They caught the guy and couldn't get him convicted for a long time. It took like 30, 40, 40, 50 years to get justice in that particular case. Fourth level, the state now disapproves. Society even disapproves to some extent, um, but you still have pockets of rogue abuses happening, like groups of people that are doing bad stuff. Classic example of that is LAPD's Ramparts Unit, which was deliberately you know, stopping people that they knew were innocent, harassing them, beating them, planting evidence, even uh, false testimony to convict people of crimes that they were not guilty of. Um, it wasn't official policy, and when it was found, it was stopped, not necessarily punished, but at least stopped, um, which is, you know, good that they stopped it, um, bad that it was sort of existing in the first place. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the, the, another one is an example more current is the Cuyahoga um, Hills sex abuse case. Of, uh, it's a juvenile corrections facility, a private ju juvenile corrections facility, where it turned out that sex abuse was happening to just about every kid that came into the place. It was like a sex club for corrections adults. Um, and um, so, you know, again, though, that was a rogue group. It wasn't policy of the state. It wasn't pursued by them. The last level and the healthiest level is when you get to the point where, yeah, they're happening, but they're happening behind closed doors. It's isolated perpetrators um, secretly harming individuals, or it's really minor level abuses that aren't easily um, noticed or tracked or even maybe recognized as violations of human rights. These include domestic violence, child abuse, housing and employment discrimination, or the bullying of gay teens, which is, um, you know, something that happens at, at a small enough level that there's, there's nobody tracking that. And it's very difficult to, to even address that level, even though it's the ideal level. You know, you want to be at that level because that's a much better level to be at than having it at level one. So how do you apply that? Okay, you, um, you need to know, okay, there's a different levels, but you also need to know where to look for abuses, especially for the level five ones where they're not easy. They're not happening in the open at all. We know this basic truism. Human rights abuse is generally a predatory behavior, and any good predator worth its salt um, targets prey weaker than themselves. So where you're going to find human rights abuses is where you find the greatest vulnerability. 
where you find the greatest differences in power. Um, that's the most likely place for human rights abuses. So we look at things that can make one vulnerable. And again, I'm not going to go over all of these individually. I don't think we need to do that. But um, they're predictable. Um, kids are more prone to abuse than adults because they're more helpless. The younger the child, the more helpless the child. Um, elders can be very much at risk if they have um, you know, any kind of issues that make it difficult for them to defend themselves. Um, members of groups that are targeted for bias, harassment, discrimination, you know, they, again, I mean, we don't need to go through the whole list, but there's a variety of different things that render people vulnerable. And so if you're looking for human rights abuses, trying to figure out where they may be happening, those are the places that you look at, which is why people concentrate on statistics like poverty um, and um, as a kind of indirect measure, and then things like numbers of hate crimes that you have in an area as a direct measure. So all that is just sort of prelude to bring us back to Washington County. So where are we in Washington County? It's tempting to congratulate ourselves for being all at level five and everything's wonderful and you know we're, we're in really good shape or it's, issues are minor or they're only happening in secret. Um, it's tempting, but it would be premature because we really don't know. Again, it's difficult to track some of that stuff, and frankly, no one has really been trying up until now. And there's even some evidence to suggest that not everything is at level five. And part of that reason may be that you can have things at more than one level. For example, um, the U.S. is, and this is actually kind of ironic, the U.S. is an international leader of human rights, inspired the de Declaration of Human Rights, drives still is one of the main you know, champions for human rights in the world, yet we're still at level one for <laughs> article number five, which is torture. We were at le level two. It was happening. It was being state-driven, but it was done in secret, and the um, state denied it. And, um, and now they're actually openly saying, yeah, no, we not only do this, but we defend our right to do this. We're looking for justifications to do this. And this is despite having you know, signed the Geneva Convention and all the rest of it. Um, so uh, another example is, is the marriage one. Article 16 says that human rights, it, willing adults have the right to choose who they're going to marry. Yet in many states in the US, um, same-sex marriage of willing adults is prohibited by law. Um, Though we are good about the um, pro prohibitions against involuntary marriage of child brides, um, which is pretty rare in the United States, and when it does occur, it's very secret um, and prosecuted as a crime. So you have to kind of look at the things, not only the articles sort of one by one, looking at the relevant behaviors to see where we may uh, fall short, but also at the kind of the levels. If it's not happening at the level of the state, is it happening at some other level? Is it happening as a level, at the level of rogue abusers? Is it happening at the level of um, you know, just individuals in, in behind closed doors? So we originally were learning about these kinds of issues um, the way most human rights organizations do, which is trying to just respond to issues as they arose in the community. And um, it wasn't any kind of a systematic approach, um, but um, many of us were, were aware of the work simply because of the work that we do. Um, I work with refugees, I work with uh, human services, I work with um, poverty prevention programs and, and the like, and so I knew some of that kind of stuff from my work. Uh, we have members in law enforcement who know about these kinds of issues from their perspective. Uh, we've got people in um, police oversight and city government, communities of color, faith, education, um, service organizations. So some of us, you know, we brought a certain level of knowledge and passion around it just by the nature of the work that we do. Um, but we also connect with other people separately, um, other groups and experts to see what we can learn. And we've hosted forums and listening groups to actually hear directly from people in the communities. It was still sort of haphazard though. Even so, it was enough to turn out a few things. These are some of the issues that we've learned are occurring right here that um, many residents aren't aware of, including the sex trafficking of underage girls. And that's, I mean, I'm talking Washington County specifically, not just the greater Portland you know, or Portland or Oregon in general. 
We know that there's labor trafficking of adults that's happening. We know that we've got homeless kids, um, high school students, for example, who are trying to finish school while living out of their cars um, or you know, under bridges and stuff. Um, we know that there's not enough shelter beds for the homeless or for those trying to escape domestic violence in this county. We know that we still have um, instances of lethal child, elder, and domestic uh, abuse. In some cases, even after victims have tried to find help and were not able to get help. Um, we know that housing and labor discrimination are still very common, and the estimates were actually kind of scary, like 75% of um, people surveyed had had um, actively, you know, in instances of verified um, abuses, and that's um, federal statistics, not just um, advocacy groups that one might suspect that they wouldn't, you know, do their research properly. Um, we have some hate activity and occasional hate crimes. It's not a lot. Uh, it's usually maybe one hate crime a year in the whole county, which is pretty darn good. Um, still too many, but it's pretty good. Um, and then we have serious ones only about once in a decade. Um, but we do have things like routine bullying of, of gay teens in schools. Um, and discrimination, hostility, harassment of those who are or are even just perceived to be Muslim or Latin American illegal immigrants. We don't seem to worry about the Canadian illegal immigrants. Looking at you there, Rob. Okay. Um, what it has led us to, though, is kind of the more we study it, the more we realize that we need a more systematic way to look at uh, human rights issues in Washington County to provide um, data so that we can identify and guide efforts to address more serious issues, not just by um, – sorry, I lost my train of thought entirely there. But instead of waiting for a reactive response to actually let the data drive the efforts instead of you know, just being something that we collect along the way in a haphazard manner. So what we have aimed to do within the Human Rights Council is to develop a report card for the county that would include the following elements. It would identify, you know, actually collect data around actual events, for example, numbers of hate crimes. Um, or police complaints of discrimination or harassment, those kinds of things, um, housing discrimination complaints, but also indirect measures where we know that vulnerability exists because that's um, a measure of how likely you are, again, to have um, human rights abuses happening. Um, and then secondly, to conduct, we do, um, to start conducting an annual survey of human rights issues with communi community leaders, um, uh, advocates, service providers, other people in a position to be able to see this stuff if it's happening, but it's, they see it in isolation and aren't necessarily connecting with others um, who are seeing maybe other issues or the same issue from a different perspective. So it's to try to get a broad spectrum view in, of, of specific questions. And then to also continue you know, with the listening sessions and listening to people you know, talking about issues um, that affect their communities. So we are about to launch the Human Rights Survey for the first time, um, and it's literally going out within a week or two. And um, this short, it's a short survey, but uh, we're hoping that it'll get at least at a beginning of having some kind of ability to identify what are the key issues and where should we start trying to work on it. And then we plan to release that um, publicly this spring at a roundtable event that includes many of the same people that the survey went to, also um, members of our advisory council. Um, so that we can discuss those, the findings and, and actually brainstorm ideas about what we might want to do to change that. So that's basically what we've got planned right now. And, um, yeah. and so I thank you for your time and listening and uh, invite any questions. Thank you, Lori. Wonderful presentation. And as people are lining up for questions, just another reminder, for those of you at home, not only is the service good here at the Pepper Mill, so is the food. Next week, well, I'll announce next week's program later. Right now, we're going to address questions. Sir. Lori, thanks for being here. I appreciate your presentation. I'm wondering if you can help me um, Get your take on what the most pressing issue that really isn't well known by the public in Washington County is, you know, police misconduct. You mentioned bullying of gay youth. In terms of if there's one 
pain point to address, and if you had a magic wand, what would you say that your attention would be drawn to for solving human rights issues in Washington County? Well, I have a slight bias, probably. I mean, actually, I, I worked in the field of, of police oversight, and I do not think that that is in, in Washington County. I would not define that as, a, as one of the um, more serious issues that we have here. I think, actually, we've got a remarkably good uh, law enforcement response to human rights issues and to trying to address issues of discrimination and harassment. So actually, I would, I would you know, a little shout out to, um, to our local law enforcement agencies in that regard. Um, but I do have a slight bias. I also work on uh, task forces uh, for the Department of Justice on uh, domestic violence. And that's an area that I think um, is not widely even recognized as a human rights issue to people. They think it's a behind closed doors, private, personal thing. Only, you know, again, speaking from background of, of public health and, and um, epidemiology, from a social epidemiological perspective, when you've got, what, 15% of your population that is in fear of serious injury or death, um, you can call that an epidemic. It may be happening at the individual level, but so does, so do public health issues. I mean, if you eat something and get E. coli, you ate it at your house and you're throwing up in your toilet, so it's a private issue? No, it's a public issue. It's a public health issue. And in the same way, even though the injuries happen at the level of individuals behind closed doors, um, we have a serious problem that affects a large number of people in very serious ways. It's the one truly preventable form of homicide um, if you do the right things. So I would, I would actually say that um, domestic violence is probably one of them. But I would, next to that, I would also put um, the extreme vulnerability of immigrant populations, particularly if they are not legal. They are absolute sitting ducks for all kinds of abuses simply because they don't have the legal protections and they have to operate under the radar in secret and you start to create a whole subculture around uh, exploitation and abuse of those people that it, it bleeds over. Because when, when you've got bad people doing bad things here, they don't necessarily stop at, you know, oh, just this target group. It, it actually starts to impact the quality of life for everybody around them. So I would, um, I would say some of the trafficking issues and um, issues around um, exploitation of, of illegal immigrants would, would also be one of the issues that I think. But I don't know for sure because we don't have the measures yet. We don't have these objective measures. We've only been responding in a reactive way, as most human rights organizations tend to do. And so it's an attempt, what we're trying to do right now is get on the other side of that. And instead of just reacting to issues as they arise and as we learn about them, to actually go out and seek you know, a, a more systematic way to try to identify and, and prioritize those things. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. I was interested in seeing the Declaration of Human Rights number 23, and it pertained to fair employment at fair wages. And I'm wondering about it as a human rights issue, the uh, status of the middle class and the income inequality we now face in our country and presumably in Washington County as well. And uh, the ripple effect of that seems to be pretty substantial. And I'm wondering if in your survey you deal at all with, uh, say, fair wages, uh, minimum wages, economic, uh, equal or, uh, economic equity and that kind of issue. Thank you. That is an excellent question. I picked the one example of torture as an example of uh, an area where the U.S. does not agree with the international standards of human rights. Another area where the U.S. has chosen not to agree, they do not see it as a basic human right or do not agree that it's a basic human right. And that is true for um, both um, wages and for um, health care. Access to health care is considered a, a basic human right in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but in this country it is considered a privilege and, and it is not considered something that people have a basic right to. That's sort of changing with the ACA. Um, Oregon now went from having an average of, gosh, I don't remember the exact statistics, but somewhere in the range of two people a day dying for lack of access to um, basic health care or basic medications because they couldn't afford it. 
or they didn't have health care coverage. We've, that's now changed to where now I think it's somewhere in the range of 93%, over 90% of um, Oregonians are now covered by some, have access to some basic health care, um, which puts us way ahead of the rest of the nation. So in answer to your question, um, wages, a living wage, the right to, to, for workers to get paid a living wage is considered a fundamental human right in the Universal Declaration and in many countries, and we have not, um, we have not adopted that in the United States. We don't accept that that's a basic human right. We think of that, again, as a privilege or something that the market should decide or um, it's not considered a fundamental human right. In terms of did we include it in the survey, we did not specifically include it in the survey because we were trying to do um, the initial survey we wanted to do, what's called in research language, unprimed, where we don't tell people, here's your options, what do you think is most important? We instead just ask them, what do you think is the most important issue? So the question I had was about uh, sex trafficking, particularly underage sex trafficking and the extent to which you guys are working on that. Uh, that's one of the issues we've started working on legislatively and fairly early on we found out that it's really tough to address that issue in this area. There's no way around the fact that there's a strip club on every other block in Portland. So I was just wondering what approaches you guys were taking and kind of the work you were doing on that particular issue. And, and that's another good question because that is something that we personally have a lot of passion around. Um, and I know certainly, you know, um, many of us, that's, a, that's an issue that we find extremely painful to think is going on in, in our area. Um, also with my law enforcement though, um, background, I know that it is a very difficult issue to, to address, um, in part because most of the victims think that they are the partners of their abusers. They don't realize often that they are, um, you know, they think this is their boyfriend. He's making them do this stuff, but, but he really loves them and it's for their, you know, it, it just, it makes it very, very, very difficult. But to answer your question about, you know, the approach that we would take, I'd have to say we're not taking that approach because that's not our role and that can't be our role. That's, we don't have that kind of authority. We don't have that kind of power. We don't have the number or the resources to actually take on the issue of, of human trafficking. Um, we care about it. We want to try to draw attention to it. We want to help people talk about it and try to develop responses to it, but that needs to be something that's done by law enforcement or other kinds of outreach activities that have resources far beyond anything that we do um, in order to address those issues. Um, though we certainly want to help get that rolling or, or strengthen the efforts in that regard. <laughs>